be looking out for that and calling on you. And I'd like to introduce you to Andrew Bernard, the director of our UMass Core Facilities. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for joining us today. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard and I'm the director of our centralized core facilities here at UMass Amherst. Uh, a lot of you have heard my spiel, so please uh, bear with me as we go through it again. But uh, we uh, in IELTS and in the cores know the great impact our core facilities have on the research community. But too often we find out too late that others on and off campus are not familiar with our capabilities. So we've been hosting the course seminar series to provide awareness and to hear from our partners, including success stories from experienced users and technology experts. This is our sixth seminar of the semester uh, and several more to go before the end of the semester. And we're starting to plan for the spring semester as well. So if there are any cores or specific technologies you'd like to feature, or if you'd like to speak on behalf of any of the cores, please let us know. There's a form you'll get after the, after the event today that you can fill out and say what you'd like to see and the forms available online as well. Uh, for those of you who may not have worked with us in the past, uh, the UMass core facilities are open to anyone from undergrads through to senior scientists, regardless of affiliation, uh, including academic researchers, uh, corporate partners, anybody that has an interest in any of the resources we have, we'd love to have you work with us. You can send samples for analysis. You can send designs for 3D printing. You can become a trained user in many of the facilities. Uh, regardless, there are ample opportunities for you to engage no matter your level of expertise. There are also many opportunities for you to fund your work in the cores. UMass users have several opportunities with seed funding, especially those who are in the IELTS uh, uh, Center, uh, the Institute for Applied Life Sciences, uh, especially those who are IELTS faculty members and get direct credits to use the core facilities. If you want more information about that, please ask me. For our external users, uh, who I hope have, we have some joining us today, there's a Massachusetts program called the Innovation Voucher Program that subsidizes up to 75% of your usage of, of the core facilities. Over the last two years, across the five UMass campuses, we've awarded more than 400 vouchers, totaling more than $5 million worth of project work. We're here to be your partner and to help you expand your research productivity. Reach, feel free to reach out to me directly, to Steve as a core facility director, or to any of our core facilities if you have any questions or would like to engage further. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Miles, director of the Mass Spectrometry Core Facility. Steve's been directing the facility since 2000, long before IELTS or centralized cores here at Amherst were a concept. He's grown the facility to have more than 12 mass spectrometers under his purview. From engaging and training students to the inordinate amount of hours he's spent troubleshooting, oftentimes with his hands deeply in some of those machines somehow, uh, Steve has been an invaluable contribution to the university. Personally, from my first few days here on campus, Steve has been a tremendous asset, teaching me a lot of the ways of how university works and providing levity in, in some stressful times. So I'm grateful for Steve and the contributions he's given. I hope you'll enjoy the talk. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Steve. Great, thank you. I'm always happy to drink beer. <laughs> um, now I can't advance my slides. How do I do it? Uh, apparently I broke the presentation, so that was good. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, just to give a brief overview of the uh, mass spec facility, um, we do a little bit of everything in terms of characterizing uh, molecules, compounds, larger biomolecules. Um, we can do um, proteomics. We can look at protein dynamics using hydrogen deuterium exchange. Um, we can do elemental analysis by ICP. Um, and just to give you a few um, brief overviews of some of the instrumentation we have. Um, on the left here, we have an ICPMS, which is ideally suited for doing elemental quantitation, um, particularly metals. And we can do some tissue imaging with our laser ablation system. Um, for small molecule volatile analysis, we can use um, gas chromatography. Uh, we have a triple quad, which is great for doing um, sensitive quantitation of small volatile materials. Uh, we can also do headspace analysis um, of molecules in gases. Um, for proteomics and metabolomics, we have a high resolution uh, Orbitrap fusion instrument, um, which has both a nano LC and a, a ultra high pressure um, liquid chromatography system attached to it. Um, and we also have a system that can do um, uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange in an automated manner. This, this robotic system um, allows us to do HTX in a completely unattended manner. 
And we can also use this uh, Synapse system and a newer one that we just recently purchased for doing uh, native mass spectrometry with ion mobility to look at um, molecules in the gas phase and their uh, shapes and conformations. And then finally, the last instrument I want to talk about today, which is going to be the focus of um, Christina's talk in a minute, is our um, Ultraflex Moldy Toft Toft system, um, which can really scan a, a broad range of molecular weights from uh, lipids and peptides up to proteins, uh, synthetic polymers, and importantly, can be used for um, tissue imaging, um, which will be the focus of, of the talk today. Um, so we provide a full range of services from um, consultation and product design through um, grant application support. We obviously do a lot of user training. We're very um, keen to have users come in and actually physically use the instrumentation so they fully understand how to do it. Um, but we can also do service analysis and um, advanced data analysis. Um, and there's some contact information. Um, you can either contact me or my associate, uh, Cedric Bobst, who is right next door to me. Um, and we can hopefully help you out with um, any mass spec applications you'd like to uh, think about. So that's me done. Um, and I would like now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Silvescu from Brooker Daltonics. Uh, she's an image application scientist at Brooker. Um, she did her PhD at University of New Hampshire, so just up the road, and then did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, and then moved to Sanofi Genzyme, where she started developing uh, methodologies for doing tissue imaging. Um, and after that, moved to Brooker Daltonics, which is a company that actually makes these kind of instruments and um, is now working on applications that she will talk about. Um, welcome, Christina, and thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. It's all yours. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay, that's good. Um, so today I'm going to talk about multi mass spectrometry imaging and the new workflow that we call spatial omics for in depth analysis of um, the images that we generate with multi mass spectrometry. So, just a quick review of the principle of mass spectrometry imaging. Um, it's, we can use as a samples different set of uh, either um, individual cells, organs, or even whole uh, animal bodies. Uh, we cut in sections through organs or whole uh, animal body, or we uh, layer um, monolayers of, of uh, individual cells on glass slides. Um, and then we cover these glass slides with um, a uniform matrix layer. So we can do this by using different instruments in the lab. Uh, the cryostat, uh, we use to cryosection um, organs and um, animal and, and whole body animals. Um, we also can use either frozen tissue or FFP, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissue. Um, and uh, once we mount, after we mount the tissue on the slide, then we uh, cover the entire section with a um, uniform layer of matrix using um, different uh, spray, matrix spraying devices. So there are a few matrix spraying devices available for this pro process. Um, then we, are, we fire the laser on the surface of the tissue section in a raster pattern. And at each um, point in the raster, we acquire a mass spectrum. So you see, we generate a collection of mass spectra at the end with the X, Y coordinates of each of these mass spectra in the original um, tissue section. By putting together this whole collection of mass spectra, we can extract tissue distribution 
and iron intensities throughout the uh, entire section surface. So that's how we can generate hundreds to thousands of ion images in one mass spectrometry run. And we can monitor multiple classes of compounds uh, with uh, mass spectrometry imaging, and we can identify their localization in tissue. We can do this with the Ultraflex Extreme TOF-TOF instrument that you have available in uh, your lab. And I'm going to show next a few examples of, uh, um, of uh, mass spectrometry imaging experiments that were performed on the Ultraflex Extreme. Um, and also the um, informational value of these mass spectrometry images. But because we generate a large amount of data, we generate a whole library of, of individual pixel spectra, uh, and we monitor multiple compounds in each spectrum simultaneously, uh, we need some um, analysis tool, some statistical analysis tool to help, to help us understand this complexity of the tissue. So, um, as you can see here, we after we ionize the, um, the compounds and generate these tissue distributions of each individual compound, we can co-register the mass spectrometry images with uh, an optical image um, um, obtained from the tissue section, um, a stained um, optical image you can use to co-register co with mass spectrometry imaging, um, uh, HNE staining, immunofluorescence staining, all kinds of histology um, uh, prep uh, sections. We can co-register the images with a mass spectrometry image. This allows us to understand the tissue morphology and to understand the, the specific localization of each individual molecule that we, we image. So um, besides these co-registration features, we also have an entire tool set of uh, analytical uh, tools. Um, we use statistic, statistical tools for um, data analysis we are looking at principal component analysis for understanding variability in a large data set. We look at classification uh, to understand um, uh, different differences among different classes of, of, um, um, of um, sample in a large sample cohort. Um, we use uh, statistical tools to, to predict outcomes in disease progression, for example. We use um, uh, hierarchical clustering of the entire um, molecular fingerprint that we generate in imaging to um, uh, map tissue distribution of multiple classes of compounds. And, uh, and we can perform automated mapping of the mass spectrometry image. So all these um, uh, features that um, uh, mass spectrometry image enables allows us to um, analyze, to, to answer different type of questions. And next I'm gonna show you a few examples uh, of uh, different types of analysis that we can use mass spec for which we can use mass spectrometry imaging. For example, in this um, in this study, um, they were able to um, first identify uh, individual cellular markers for different um, tissue um, uh, morphology for different classes of cells um, in the intestinal um, tissue, and. Also, they were able to identify um, cellular markers specific to uh, different classes of immune cells. So they use mass spectrometry imaging and individual cellular markers, first of all, to map the tissue, the environment um, of interest, and then to um, identify um, localization of immune cells infiltrated into this um, 
um, tissue. So this, we are looking at uh, the um, human in intestine. This is a section to the human intestine. And this is important to monitor on any type of uh, inflammatory diseases. Uh, because you want to see uh, where exactly uh, the immune cells are um, lo localized and whether they are activated or not. So based on different molecular markers, and these are protein markers, they were able to, to map the tissue and to identify the localization of these immune cells. Um, and this is label free, right? So we are not staining with any antibody. We are not staining with any uh, with any staining here. Um, this is based on only on the um, uh, intrinsic properties of the um, uh, proteins in mass spectrometry. Um, another example uh, where they are looking to monitor um, uh, disease biomarkers in this case, um, they, in this study, they are looking at lipid distribution in the, uh, in, in the brain. And this is the um, molecular model for the uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, you can see here in the images, they, were, they are able to map individual functional areas in the brain based on different classes of lipids you see here in red and green. And then um, with a um, sequential workflow, uh, where they can analyze first the lipids and then wash away the lipids, spray a different matrix that's specific to proteins, uh, they can identify tissue distribution of amyloid plaques in Alzheimer. So these are peptide accumulated in specific areas of the brain, and you see them in blue here. Um, but if you look at these images, you can see that not only the amyloid plaque, the amyloid beta, um, uh, peptides are accumulated in these specific areas in blue, but you also can see different classes of uh, lipids and that accumulate in these areas, and especially lipids that are associated with uh, um, cell toxicity, with cell death, like um, ceramides and phosphatidylinositols. So it gives you, um, first of all, a distribution of the entire tissue um, that allows you to map the functional areas of the tissue. But then you also gain information about the function of each individual compounds that are accumulated in these pathological areas, in these amyloid plaques um, specific to Alzheimer's disease. Um, another example, this is in pharmacology and toxicology. Um, they were interested in this case to actually identify tissue distribution of a dosed um, drug. This is from GlaxoSmithKline. Um, and they were trying to identify where exactly this drug is, is migrating in the organism, but they could not detect this drug with LCMS. Um, and then they perform mass spectrometry imaging on uh, different organs. And here they are focusing on the liver. And they've seen that the drug was highly concentrated in the bile ducts, you see here in your red, but it's not present anywhere else in the tissue. So when you homogenize the entire tissue and try to analyze the tissue with, with LCMS, you are losing the, the uh, localization of this drug, but because it's also fairly low concentrated, um, the signal intensity is lost in the, um, in the background of the entire homogenized uh, tissue. So uh, in, with using mass spectrometry imaging in this, in this case, they were able to actually identify the localization, but also to detect this drug in tissue because they weren't able to do that. 
Moreover, when they were looking at one of the drug metabolites, they observed that this drug metabolite is accumulating in certain areas of the uh, dog liver. And when compared the mass spectrometry imaging with uh, the histology, they observed that exactly in the same area where the drug metabolite is accumulating, they've seen tissue infiltrates. Uh, immune cells infiltrated in those regions, which is a sign of inflammation. So they've seen that they were able to actually uh, correlate this um, uh, drug metabolite with a, a pathologic outcome of the drug dosing. Um, so it gives you, a, mass spectrometry imaging can give you different type of information and um, uh, multiple um, uh, components of your um, analysis can be answered by mass spectrometry imaging. And here we are going deeper into the uh, drug response. Uh, they are using mass spectrometry imaging, they are trying to understand therapeutic response of erlotinib. Erlotinib is a, a um, um, anti-cancer drug, uh, but it doesn't have high efficacy. And they wanted to understand what, what, what's wrong, why, why the drug is not very efficacious. So uh, to do that, uh, they examined the normal and the tumor regions uh, uh, of a dosed um, animal. Um, and from the mass spectrometry image, they observed that that both the erlotinib, the drug itself, and some of its metabolites, first of all, they don't penetrate very well the tissue environment, the, the tumor environment, the restricted tumor environment. You can see here on the right side of each of the images. The intensity of the drug and the metabolites is much, uh, it's decreased compared to the normal tissue. But then when they looked in depth with mass spectrometry imaging and some of the statistical analysis tools that I mentioned earlier, they were able to generate a composite map of the tissue that contains specific functional areas of the tissue. Um, and then uh, they, also, they were also able to map the drug that's present in this functional area and the drug that's present outside of this functional areas. In the end, they, uh, they, they realize that, that they, they have a positive outcome of the drug treatment only when the drug is localized in dysfunctional areas, not outside. So for them, it was very important to understand this localization. And um, if, if you just try to homogenize the tissue, you would lose all this information and you cannot understand drug efficacy, the, the mechanism of action of the drug. So because we are able to um, generate all this type of information, we, we understood that uh, using mass spectrometry imaging is gonna help us to, to, um, to unveil uh, important features of, first of all, um, uh, biomarkers, different disease biomarkers, understand disease progression, but also response to treatment. To, um, use, to use this, these capabilities, we developed a workflow um, that we called multi-guided spatial omics. This allows us in the first step to use multi mass spectrometry to uh, map the tissue. So we cut thin sections through the organ, we mount it on the, on the glass slide, we acquire the mass spectrometry image, we use statistical analysis tools to understand which regions in the region in the tissue is affected. For example, if you see um, inflammation in certain region that's, that's associated with a drug presence or a metabolite presence, right, as we've seen before. Or maybe we are comparing um, a normal region versus a tumor or a disease region, right? 
using the statistic, statistical analysis tools allows us to automatically annotate those regions and to extract information based on uh, uh, regional specific information, right? And then uh, using these tools, we identify the regions of interest or maybe molecules of interest. And because we have the mass spectrometry we have the um, coordinates, the XY coordinates from the mass spectrometry image, we can extract these regions of interest. And there are a few different um, um, uh, methods of micro extraction, in, including laser capture micro dissection, or uh, LISA or liquid extraction, um, or even just with manual pipetting, we can extract um, areas of the tissue that we want to analyze in depth. Um, and then we use um, LCMSMS to understand different classes of molecules and the changes that are happening in different classes of molecules in those specific regions. In this way, we preserve the tissue localization of regions of interest but also we get in-depth molecular uh, information about those um, um, regions of interest. Um, so for this, we are using a, a special um, instrument that we have developed recently. This is um, the Timstof Flex. The Timstof Flex is a dual source instrument. It has on the uh, Left side, the uh, electrospray sort. This has uh, this has LC and nano LCMS uh, capabilities. Um, I'm going to talk later a bit about passive, which is parallel accumulation and serial fragmentation, and um, it also has the capability of gaining in-depth molecular information um, with. Sorry, louder. Um, okay, so on the right side of the instrument of the Timstof Flex, we have the MALDI source. Um, the MALDI source allows us to map the tissue um, and to, with the um, uh, high spatial resolution. We, uh, and um, we also have included in this instrument the trap tie and mobility um, separation cell. Um, so the, this is the layout of the instrument, which allows us to perform this spatial omics workflow. We have the Smarvin 3D laser. This, the laser is focused down to five microns, which gives us very high spatial resolution. So it gives us important um, uh, spatial content information. Um, and the... Uh, uh, we have here the uh, MALDI target where we mount our tissue slides. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see uh, the orthogonal um, capillary from the ESI source. Um, we have a dual team structure and mobility cells, the fast switching quadrupole, the collision cells, and the ultra high resolving um, QTOF. Um, and you see here on top, a mass spectrometry image uh, experiment. Um, it's acquiring, so the laser is firing over the tissue surface. And every time where the laser is firing, uh, we generate an individual spectrum for that uh, pixel. Um, so I'm going to show you now how we use this multi guided specialomics to extract information about distribution of multiple classes of molecules. Um, so first, we would use the MALDI to map the uh, tissue section. And you see here a, um, an, ex an example of an extracted uh, ion distribution in, in green on top. Um, so this is one single lipid and distribution to all the um, a sagittal section through uh, rat brain. And because of our high spatial resolution um, capabilities, we are able to 
uh, identify individual cells in these tissue sections. Uh, we are looking here at um, in the cerebellum, uh, individual uh, cell uh, pixels uh, that correlate very well with the histology staining. Um, and these are uh, specific to the Purkinje cells in the brain. Um, on the bottom, you see a um, uh, mass spectrometry image where we core register four different uh, molecular distributions. So these are four different lipids. Um, and you can see that by core registering these multiple um, compounds, multiple molecules, we can map the uh, tissue um, and identify uh, functional areas of the sagittal section of the brain. You see here in the back, the cerebellum, the corpus callosum, the cortex, and the basal brain. Um, now, we can map the tissue by co-registering multiple um, uh, ion images, as you see in this case. But we also can do this with um, unsupervised statistical analysis. In each of these experiments, we generate hundreds to thousands of molecular images, hundreds to thousands of dis distributions like this that we call register. So we don't really want to go manually to, to look at each individual image. So for that, we use statistical analysis. We use um, hierarchical clustering, where we are looking to all the molecules in the tissue. We classify them based on intensity and uh, uh, distribution. Uh, and then based on these classes, that hierarchical clustering that we generate based on this tree, uh, we assign an individual color to each of the class, and then we can represent each of the class into the tissue map, into the segmentation map. And you can see that we can generate the same functional areas. We can map the functional areas of the brain uh, very efficiently in an automated manner based on the uh, entire set of uh, mass spectrometry images that we generate within one experiment. So once we created this segmentation hierarchical clustering and segmentation map, we can extract regions of interest. Each of that class, we can create from each of the class from in the hierarchical clustering tree, we can create a, a region of interest. And you can see here a few regions of interest that were extracted. These have uh, these are very specific. For example, the red one is on the cortex, the blue, the corpus callosum, right? So they are very uh, faithful to the uh, distribution of the, um, the um, morphological functions in the tissue section. And then we can extract each of this region. And uh, each, of the, each of this region is going to contain a set, a collection of spectra. And then we can analyze this collection molecules that are present in each of these regions, right? Um, and um, we are using a, um, another software. This is Metaboscape that allows us to import the data from skills, the statistical analysis software, um, uh, and allows us to identify uh, various um, molecules. As Metaboscape is mostly based on lipids and metabolites, um, uh, based on our 4D lipidomics approach. And I'm going to talk about 4D omics a little bit later. But using these statistical analysis softwares and, and database searches, um, it allows us to identify each uh, molecules pre molecule present in this um, uh, regions of interest that we created earlier. Um, and now we can generate the tissue distribution of each individual ion, uh, uh, M of a Z ion, but we also have the label 
uh, of this uh, molecule uh, based on library searches. And um, for the omics, which involve um, uh, searches based on four parameters. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about 4D omics, because you can see we can generate hundreds to thousands of images. We can use statistical analysis software to, to um, automatically understand the tissue distribution of this, um, this molecules, but we also want to identify them and we want to gain in-depth molecular information about these molecules that we are imaging. Uh, and for that, we use LCMS. So as I said before, this is a dual source instrument. It has the MALDI on one side, the, LCM, the ESI part, which is LCMS compatible on the other, the other side. Um, and um, it's also equipped with trap time mobility separation, which allows us to perform this 4D omics analysis. And here is an example of 4D proteomics. Um, for 4D proteomics, we, we characterize the molecules that we analyze, the, the peptides in this case, based on the retention time coming from the LC, uh, based on the ion mobility coming from the, um, the PIMS cell, uh, based on M of a Z uh, on the mass to charge ratio, and also based on MSMS. Now, our instrument, uh, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, collisional cross section, which is a, um, which is a function of the way molecules um, uh, range in space, in gas phase, right? So we can think of about this as the, so consider the conformation of the of different molecules that they can, can uh, take in gas phase. Um, you can have isomeric structures that are exactly the same and the same, the same mass uh, in, um, but they will have different conformation. So based on their conformations, they will uh, have a different uh, collisional cross section and you can think about the collisional cross-section at the shadow that you can see here in the diagram, a shadow that the molecule um, uh, projects on a wall. Um, tighter packed, maybe a smaller molecule is going to generate a smaller collisional cross-section, whereas a larger, uh, fluffier, you know, more extended molecule is going to generate a larger collisional cross-section. But because uh, this, 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 there are multiple molecules out there that may have the same MOS, the same molecular weight, but they, they have different conformation and has different collisional cross section. We can differentiate these molecules based on ion mobility and collisional cross section. With our instruments, collisional cross-section is an intrinsic value of the molecule. It's reproducible, um, and um, it's um, it's uh, always specific to a different type of molecules, uh, depending on the shape that they take in the gas gas phase. Um, so our um, uh, trap ion mobility um, a cell is represented here. You can see we get um, um, ions from the source, from the capillary, introdu introduce them in the um, funnel one. And then we have the um, uh, ion mobility cell in the funnel one. The, the gas flow, we have a right. Maybe you can see this easier. Uh, and then we have the gas flowing in the same direction uh, and the molecules are going to migrate in the gas phase based on their collisional cross section. So fluffier molecules with wider collisional cross, so larger collisional cross section are gonna migrate further, whereas smaller molecules with, with smaller collisional cross section are gonna stay behind. We reverse the electrical field into the analyzer, and this way we trapped, 
we trap the molecules at, um, uh, based on their ion mobility at different uh, uh, potentials, right? So um, we developed the cells a little bit more. We doubled the analyzer. So practically, we stacked two uh, analyzer cells, ion mobility analyzer cells, one after the other, uh, which allows us to uh, accumulate first the part of the ions that's coming from the source um, and stack it up in uh, based on the um, uh, ion mobility, and then we can elute this, um, um, this uh, ions that are separated with different um, um, currents, with different run times, right? So we are practicing by decreasing the um, uh, electrical field uh, ramp here, we are eluting different uh, pockets of separated ions. Because we have two, um, uh, two ion mobility cells, we have high um, uh, duty cycle. We can reach 100% duty cycle in this case. Um, and uh, we can separate these molecules based on their um, uh, ion mobility. Um, so when we... When we um, I loot them out, you can see we loot already separated pockets of molecules, and then we can perform MSMS on each of these pockets of molecules to uh, generate uh, MSMS data for um, a larger number of molecules uh, because we have 100% duty cycle. So our parallel accumulation and serial fragmentation um, uh, allows us to perform more than 100 MSMS um, uh, experiments per second. And we also can see here generate individual MSMS spectra for each of the isomers that were separated based on ion mobility. Um, the ion mobility is very important in uh, in imaging studies as well, because um, we have uh, the, the tissue is a highly complex environment and uh, it uh, contains a lot of isomeric compounds. The CCS value and the spatial coordinates allow us to generate this 4D uh, molecular images. Um, and you see here an example where we use uh, ion mobility to separate two isomeric species, uh, two compounds that are, uh, they have both the same uh, M over Z, uh, but they have different mobilities. And you can see here the, uh, in the mobilogram, uh, different peaks. Uh, one of the ions is highly intense. Uh, you see here distribution in red in the mass spectrometry image. Another one is not that intense, but it has very specific localization. And when we co-register these two, we can observe differential distribution of these ions, which would not be possible without ion mobility. So this I, generating all this information is important for us because whenever we are looking in Issue, we are looking at highly complex environments. You can see here a section to a, a breast tissue uh, that contains a lot of information, different classes of molecules, different, different types of cells, and trying to distinguish um, this, this, this uh, molecular information from different cellular types, which are highly um, uh, interlocked. Uh, it's uh, um, it's quite difficult without being able first to map the tissue to identify different regions with different uh, molecular content. Um, so we do this with the statistical analysis, with the segmentation, mapping of the tissue, and then with LCMS we go in depth to identify. I have one more thing that I want to add to our um, in-depth molecular analysis. To our TeamStopFlex, the dual source instrument, we can add the MALDI-2 
Um, so MALDI2 principle is actually um, working off of the regular MALDI. So this is the standard MALDI experiment. We are firing the laser on the uh, target. We are um, uh, dissolving uh, both matrix and um, and molecular ions, and we are transferring the energy from the matrix, which absorbs efficiently the, the laser energy to the analytes to ionize them, right? But with MALDI2, we uh, 10, 10 microseconds later, after the first laser fire, we are firing another perpendicular um, laser on the ion plume. So this allows a post-ionization uh, event that um, excites and ionizes even more uh, neutral molecules that may be uh, lost otherwise, uh, even though they are, they may be um, dissolved from the surface due to the first multi um, event. So the post-ionization multi MALDI2 allows us to increase sensitivity for detection of multiple compounds, including sterol, uh, so, uh, liposoluble vitamins, glycolipids, phospholipids, hormones, and a lot of other classes that we are, um, we are um, monitoring now and, uh, and um, uh, identify um, increase sensitivity for, for these compounds uh, when we are using MALDI2. And you see here a spectrum. Uh, this is just an expanded area of the spectrum. With MALDI2, we have few extra uh, molecules detected in comparison to MALDI on the bottom. And you see here on each of these images, on the left side, we have the regular MALDI M um, image generated. So you can see that MALDI is capable of detecting some compounds, but some of them uh, at this concentration that are present in this tissue are not able to be detected with regular MALDI. When we switch the second laser on MALDI2, we start identifying different classes of molecules. And you can see that these are quite um, um, high mobility lipids. Um, specific to different regions of the brain in this case. Um, so MALDI2 increases the number of molecules that we can ionize from the tissue. But because the tissue is such a complex um, environment, with MALDI2 we make it even complex, right? We, we start to, to, to visualize extra molecules that we wouldn't see regularly. And that's where our trapped ion mobility um, helps us a lot to actually differentiate and identify these extra molecules that we are capable of ionizing with MALDI2. So you see here an example um, on the left side, uh, regular image with MALDI, on the right side, MALDI2 image, it's much more complex. We are, uh, we are um, imaging here this one single M over Z. Now, when we open up the um, mobility range and look into that M over Z um, area, we observe that with MALDI, we detect only one molecule in that, in that um, M over Z range, which has um, uh, this value for the one over K zero, this is our, our mobility value. But uh, when we looked at the MALDI two, image, we observe that we have actually two different uh, molecules there. They have the same M over Z, but different mobility uh, values. So this tells us that we are looking actually at different molecules that have different mobilities. And when we image each of the mobilities individually, we, we can detect um, a specific tissue distribution for each of the molecules. That's how um, trapped ion mobility allows us to first uh, separate um, uh, isomeric 
species that are present in the same uh, under the same M over Z iron and the same M over Z peak. The MALDI2 provides extra information, increased sensitivity for uh, molecular detection. Um, we use the whole spatialomics workflow, first of all, to map the tissue uh, with the MALDI and then to um, to uh, move to in-depth analysis. Um, and this is actually answering a lot of questions um, because we are capable of analyzing multiple classes of molecules, including proteins and, and peptides, post-translational modification, which define the cellular function. We're looking at lipids, which first of all are very important in uh, uh, membrane structure and uh, cellular signaling also in between cells. Um, and also we can look at uh, metabolites, which are actually the first one that change in disease state, even way before any other classes of molecules. So uh, with our um, multi-guided spatial omics, we are capable of first to map the tissue and also to understand in depth uh, the molecular functions of multiple um, um, molecules that we um, generate mass spectrometry imaging, images. So um, this is all I have for today. Let me know if you have any questions, if I can clarify anything. Uh, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Marina. We are getting close to the top of the hour. Steve, I don't know if you want to uh, handle some of the questions or, or send them along rather. Sure. Um, yeah, Michelle had a question. Um, what's the minimal size that can be micro extracted? Yeah, so this is based on uh, your, um, um, your micro extraction procedure, right? Uh, Lisa has about one millimeter. Um, laser capture can go even deeper. Uh, if you use a pipette tip, <laughs> you might uh, go further. But our mass spectrometry image, it's actually quite high resolution. Um, our, our laser is focused down to five microns. So theoretically, we can generate five micron pixels. Just had a follow-up question: Is what can be done in a single cell level? That's, uh... um, yes, in proteomics. So I didn't go too deep into proteomics because um, um, we actually can do a lot at single cell level. Maybe uh, short. I think Shorter is on the line. He might be able to give you more details about proteomics. Um, but we are able to extract quite a lot of um, uh, information based on, um, on passive uh, workflow, the parallel accumulation and serial fragmentation. Um, this allows us to increase the sensitivity of the detection because we are, uh, first of all, separating all the ions that are coming um, uh, from the LC into the trapped ion mobility cell. Uh, and we have 100% duty cycle. So we accumulate, we are trapping all the ions and we are analyzing all the ions. And we can pre perform more than, uh, uh, more than 100 um, MSMS um, events per second based on trapped ion mobility. You're muted, Steve. Sorry. Um, Melissa had a question. Can you stitch slices of the brain together to view anterior to posterior changes? So we do have um, a workflow for um, MALDI imaging, or the 3D MALDI imaging, where you can acquire uh, images at different uh, levels on the in the organ, and then our skills analysis, uh, skills lab software, the, the statistical analysis software that I was uh, showing earlier, allows you to stitch together these multiple layers to create the 3D image. Great. 
Um, and then one other question was, is it possible to do this with steroid hormones, but may not be as appropriate for receptors and receptor subtypes? Maybe Melise could. Uh, um, so this is different. Again, receptors can be different types of molecules. Yes, we can look at proteins. We can look at post-translational modification, like carbohydrates. A lot of receptors are glycosylated. Um, a lot of um, um, right uh, signal molecules. We can look at a lot of them are metabolites or lipids. Um, so in the end, it depends a lot on the ionization efficacy. And we have different um, workflow for different classes of molecules, right? These specific matrices that efficiently ionize lipids or some, or metabolites or peptides and proteins. So we, we are um, uh, practically developing methods that are associated with each individual class of molecule. And if you remember in one of the, my uh, first slides, uh, we are able to um, perform a serial analysis of different classes of molecules, um, including we start first with lipids. Um, this one. So we start. This is the Alzheimer um, uh, model. They start first with a um, spraying uh, sublimation of a, a negative ion matrix. I, um, we analyze the the um, molecules in both positive and a negative ion mode. So we are detecting different classes of molecules here. And then we wash away this lipid matrix and then we spray a peptide or protein matrix that allows us to look at um, the, the protein markers this time. Thank you. We are at the top of the hour. I, I see there are some additional questions, but just in, in uh, consideration of everybody's time, I think we'll wrap here. And I will echo the sentiment in the chat right now that thank you, Christina, for a fantastic and, and thorough talk. Uh, thank you, Steve, for hosting. And thank you all for participating today. The seminar will be put online. So if you didn't get a chance or if you know some of your colleagues may have liked to see it, uh, we'll have the link so you can access it at, at any given time. And we'll have some contact info in there if you have follow-up questions. A reminder, this is, this is part of a seminar series. So we will be back in two weeks on uh, Tuesday, October 20th when we'll be learning about the histological services available in uh, the Brahma facility, biospecimen resource and molecular analysis facility, which is at Bay State at a PVLSI. This core facility has a capability to process and paraffin embed human, animal, and plant tissues, section fixed or frozen tissues, as well as perform histological analysis. Save the date, we will absolutely send notifications to remind you all, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.